Good afternoon. This is Bryant Sikorsky with Stratos Wealth Partners. Uh, I'm an independent financial planner here in uh, outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, and Cary, North Carolina. And I'd like to welcome you very much uh, today to our LPL Research's Outlook 2020, Bringing Markets into Focus. I don't think anyone could uh, disagree that there's been a lot going on in the markets lately and, and the economy and uh, in the political arena. Uh, despite that, we have some very positive outlook on, on both the economy and the markets, and I hope to share some of this with you today. Uh, hopefully, it'll be beneficial in helping you make some of the decisions that you may need to make, um, both you know personally and, and uh, professionally. So first off, um, while we look forward to this year, 2020, uh, which is also a new decade, uh, some key trends and market signals will be important to watch. Uh, this includes progress on U.S.-China uh, trade discussions and encouraging outlook from corporate America and continued strength in consumer spending. Trade risk, slower global growth, and the impeachment inquiry have garnered a lot of the headlights re headlines recently but behind the scenes, the U.S. economy has remained resilient. Economic data has been meeting lowered expectations, indicating an expansion is still enduring. And most recently, third quarter economic growth was consistent with the long-term trend of this current economic expansion, which is now more than 10 years old. The LPL research team expects the U.S. economy to continue to grow in 2020 and support continued gains for stocks although the team is increasingly mindful of our position in the business cycle. At some point, um, you know, things are going to uh, perhaps pull back even more significantly. Um, and so we're very mindful of that. So this record long expansion will have to come to at least a, a breather, if not an outright close. And this sometimes leaves investors wondering what to do or what's next. Against this backdrop, there's questions about the next potential recession and the 2020 U.S. presidential election, which both continue to be a top of mind for many investors. While we can't predict the future, one thing we can predict is that uncertainty in the market is here to stay. And we hope that uh, our research department is here to continue to help. And I want to convey this offering to you to uh, take away a couple of uh, tidbits from this presentation uh, that might help you throughout this uncertain market. So if we can, let's uh, start with a few of LPL's uh, forecast for 2020. On the domestic front, uh, LPL research expects 1.75% U.S. gross domestic product growth in 2020. And this forecast reflects the potential for continued trade uncertainty and uh, slowed uh, business investment, but with a, a steady consumer uh, hanging in there. Uh, globally, both Europe and Japan continue to struggle as they have for years with both trade uncertainty, geopolitical concerns, and very sluggish growth. Uh, therefore, we anticipate more opportunities for growth in emerging markets economies with countries outside of China playing a, a growing role. From an inflation perspective, consumer inflation has picked up slightly and LPL research believes inflation will continue to grow at a healthy but manageable rate. Employment, U.S. job growth has been steady, although recently it started to show some signs of moderating. Some cooling down would be expected at this point in the economic cycle. Regarding recession, our prolonged trade uncertainty and a potential rancorous U.S. election season will lead us to believe that the uh, recession starting in the fourth quarter of 2020 or the first quarter of 2021 could start to, to peak over the horizon. If we look at bonds, short-lived uh, and shallow yield curve inversions are not all that worrisome right at the moment. And we uh, continue to emphasize a blend of high quality intermediate bonds in tactically oriented portfolios. Uh, with stocks, uh, we look for solid U.S. equities performance to continue 
and the uh, and we see more potential upside in emerging markets than developed international markets. So we're continuing to prefer cyclic sectors for appropriate strategies as the U.S. economic expansion endures and a balance of both growth and value investment styles. So let's take a closer look at the economy itself. Our strong consumer spending has propelled the U.S. economy while clarity on trade could support business investment. Um, the U.S. economy has slowed from the 2018 pace uh, but it's still growing, and we believe it'll continue to grow through 2020, although at a slower rate than it has in the past, and we can see that here. As we looked uh, ahead back in 2018, we expected the combination of more favorable tax rates, repatriation of uh, internationally uh, sourced profits, and immediate capital expensing provisions enacted in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we thought this would be much more of a, of a tailwind for capital expenditures. However, it appears these tailwinds have been hindered by the headwinds from trade uncertainty. Slower international growth due in part to the U.S.-China trade dispute has also added pressure to U.S. economic growth, offsetting some of the impacts of fiscal stimulus and the Federal Reserve or Fed's common accommodative monetary policy. We expect these same geopolitical and trade concerns to persist throughout the year, uh, and we're offering a forecast, again, of 1.75% U.S. domestic gross product growth this year. The expected slowdown from 2019 reflects the U.S.-China trade dispute despite the partial agreement that was signed dragging into the first part of this year and increasing odds of uh, that uh, peak over the horizon of recession in uh, late 2020-2021. Now, if I ask most people if inflation is a good or a bad thing, most people will say bad. However, some inflation and some increase in prices is often a sign of economic growth, while a weak economy is often accompanied by very low or even negative inflation. The Fed targets an inflation level of about 2%, which generally indicates a healthy economy that is not overheating or growing too quickly. Now, while consumer inflation has picked up recently, even though in international trade tensions and slower global growth have had some moderating impact on producer, producer prices, consumer prices increased at a healthy pace in 2019, growing at the fastest pace of the economic cycle for a second straight month in September, as evidenced by the core consumer price index, or CPI, which excludes the cost of, uh, and the inflation, if you will, of food and energy, as this chart indicates. At the same time, year-over-year -year growth in the core producer price index, or PPI, which better reflects cost to business decline. Limited upward pressure on wholesale prices most often reduces the likelihood of an acceleration in consumer prices. So, so far we haven't really seen a slowing producer price growth translating into lower consumer inflation, likely because U.S. companies still have ample pricing power amid strong trends in domestic consumer spending. Consumer spending, which comprises approximately 70% of the economy, continues to grow at a solid pace and is anchoring the U.S. economy. The LPL research team believes that economic factors currently benefiting consumers and businesses, including full employment, moderate wage growth, and low interest rates, will help sustain healthy but manageable inflation going forward. Now, the U.S. labor market has re remained strong despite signs of weakness in other parts of the, or in other pockets of the U.S. economy. Hiring began to slow toward the end of 2019, although job growth has remained near the cycle average. And even though hiring has slowed slightly, it still looked healthy, especially considering this economic expansion is in its 11th year already. 
Other labor market uh, measures also appeared healthy. The unemployment rate stood at 3.6% in October, near a, uh, a cycle low, and initial jobless claims continued to be very subdued. Again, clarity on trade could boost business investment, enabling workers to produce more efficiently and, and thereby supporting future productivity gains. Gains in productivity can help limit the impact of increases in labor costs on companies while increasing the economy's overall economic potential. Now, while it's natural for job growth to slow uh, when the economy um, you know, is uh, near full employment, and job growth slowing over the course of the year to around 100,000 per month would be consistent with our economic outlook. Even if job growth slowed to 100,000 per month, unemployment would pick up only very modestly and could remain at or near 4%. Wage growth slowed in the third quarter too, and this is hinting that inflationary pressures could be showing signs of moderating. Average hourly earnings growth fell to 3% year over year as of October, lower than the cycle peak of 3.4% in February of 2019, but still ahead of inflation as this chart shows. This pace of wage growth should still be enough to buoy personal incomes and consumer spending without driving interest rates higher. Now, monetary policy is a coordinated effort between the U.S. Federal Reserve and global central banks right now, but uh, there are complicated dynamics to consider. There's a mismatch between the Fed and other central banks' interest rate policies, as you can see here. The danger there is that the interest rate differential between U.S. Treasuries and other sovereign debt could widen further and put more upward pressure on the value of the U.S. dollar. This would make servicing the debt payments on the dollar denominated debt issued by non-U.S. countries more expensive, which could become an increasing burden on the global economy. A stronger U.S. dollar could also um, potentially uh, weigh on U.S. exports by making them more expensive and thereby depressing international stock returns for U.S. investors. While not an explicit part of U.S. monetary policy, concern about dollar strength may be contributing to the Fed signaling greater flexibility on inflation before it further raises rates. And we expect global and central banks to keep rates at levels that encourage increased economic activity as the global economy recovers from the impact of trade disruptions. And we see ongoing central bank interventions in international markets as appropriate for, at least for now. now the biggest news in fixed income in 2019 was the, quote, yield curve. And when we talk about the yield curve, we generally mean the difference or spread between the two-year and 10-year U.S. Treasury yields. In, a more, in most normal situations when we have a healthy economy, typically long-term yields will almost always be higher than short-term yields. And this encourages lending and supports economic growth. However, when a yield curve inverts, short-term yields rise above the longer-term yields, uh, lending becomes less profitable, and consumers, business, and investors may rein in spending and investment uh, amid uh, impending recession fears. Now, typically, economic cycles end as inflation climbs, and the Fed responds by tightening monetary policy. And this may lead short-term rates to increase faster than long-term rates, inverting the yield curve and threatening a recession. However, in the United States, we've experienced almost exactly the opposite. We have below-target inflation, an accommodative Fed, a firm U.S. dollar, and falling commodities prices. Meanwhile, a variety of geopolitical risks have pushed investors looking for a safe haven into U.S. Treasuries, particularly international buyers facing negative yields in their own countries. 
even as U.S. economic fundamentals remain sound and the U.S. budget deficit continues to rise. And as a result, recent yield curve inver inversions have been characterized by long-term rates falling faster than short-term rates, increasing investor fears of an impending recession, as we can see here. Now, negative interest rates internationally have been one of the most perplexing developments in the markets in recent years. And as this chart shows, when interest rates are below zero, the lender, in theory, is paying the borrower for the privilege of providing the loan. Now, while we have concerns about how these rates normalize over the long term, uh, we don't believe that, that uh, pr this process will begin anytime soon and continues to view central bank actions of as supportive for markets, at least right now. European and Japanese rates may stay negative until growth and inflation in those countries pick up. However, with the benefits of monetary policy largely exhausted, this may take quite a while. The gap between U.S. and international yields likely will remain wide and potentially could get wider, keeping upward pressure on the U.S. dollar and at the same time, Further potential rate cuts by the Fed and other economies and market forces may keep the dollar in balance overall. Corporate earnings growth did uh, slow considerably in 2019, and this is as a result of the 2018 tax cuts, which created a, a difficult year-over-year -year, uh, comparison while global economic growth slowed and tariffs and trade uncertainty weighed on people's minds. Further progress in U.S.-China uh, trade conflict in the, US, in the early 2020 could help uh, the U.S. economic growth at or above the trend for the current economic expansion and support corporate revenue growth. Now, we believe that any small steps, as the recent partial trade agreement was signed, uh, uh, could really increase business confidence and spark capital investment, lifting corporate profits. Now, the U.S. and emerging markets uh, will stand out uh, as relatively more attractive investment opportunities than developed international markets, based in large part on relatively stronger outlooks for economic growth and corporate profits. Our earnings per share forecast on the S&P 500 is $165, which uh, we lowered in August due to increased risk to economic growth and profits from the U.S.-China trade conflict, as we show here. Now, turning to global profits, in one sense, the outlook for global profits follows the pattern of economic growth with the U.S. and emerging markets on top. We expect S&P 500 earnings growth in 2020 most likely will outpace that of Europe and Japan, consistent with uh, fact set consensus estimates. Now, as uh, 2019 ended, uh, the U.S. economy was still exhibiting some positive fundamentals despite trade uncertainty and slowing global growth. Consumer spending uh, remains strong, supported by low unemployment, steady wage growth, uh, contained inflation, and low interest rates. At the same time, the age of the economic expansion has led to questions about how long it can continue. U.S. manufacturing weakness has become a bit more pronounced, and signals from the global bond markets are a bit confusing. Uh, earnings growth has stalled in the United States and internationally, and due to the heightened geopolitical risks that must continue to be monitored, companies are lacking the visibility they need to make sound decisions about long-term investments. Clarity on trade needs to come sooner rather than later. And, um, you know, uh, we all prepare and need to prepare for a highly charged and very divisive U.S. presidential campaign. Now we get asked all the time, you know, can the uh, stock market predict the next president? And to make a long story short, uh, I don't think so. 
any more than who wins the Super Bowl is going to determine the outcome. But what this chart tries to show is what were, what were the returns, the one quarter or three month returns of the S&P 500, uh, one quarter or three months uh, uh, before presidential election, before the voting uh, day. And, and to make a long story short, what it kind of shows us here is that, uh, I don't know why this is surprising, but by and large, if the economy is doing quite well and the market is doing quite well uh, a quarter before voting day, before election day, uh, that incumbent uh, will typically win and remain in office. So uh, take it if you will, but I don't think this is going to do much. There's so much going on in this uh, this current go-round of the election that uh, heavens only knows what, what we can possibly expect. So with that, I will say thank you very much for joining me. This is Bryant Sikorsky with Stratos Wealth Partners. Uh, I've brought up here for you my website. Uh, and a couple of things I wanted to show you here are, number one, uh, at the very bottom, if you want to contact me, um, this is all of my contact information in the lower left-hand corner, number one. Number two, as you see here, this LPL Financial Research is Outlook 2020, bringing markets into focus. And if you click on this, it will bring up this uh, presentation. And this is how you can kind of go through and uh, review what I just uh, presented to you uh, in, I have to admit, a little more colorful fashion than, than I did. So that's, that's another place that you can... Uh, touch to, to get some additional information. And finally, if you look here at the upper right hand corner, you can see this little YouTube icon. And if you click on that, it will take you over to my YouTube channel. And what I will do is I will take this recording and upload it to YouTube in just a, a little bit. And that way, if you uh, instead of reading the materials, you'd like to have it presented to you again, like I've just done. You can go here and and uh, and view this uh, presentation all over again. Uh, I also have a number of other articles in here, or other videos here, on insurance and investment topics uh, that might be of interest to you. So with that, I'll say again, thank you very much. This is Bryant Sikorsky for Stratos Wealth Partners. Uh, you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.